please join me in welcoming Prof Professor Chris Gerdes from Mechanical Engineering and Stanford University. Chris is also the co-director of the Center for Automotive Research at Stanford. And I'm sure you know, we have a, more than 130 participants on the, on the call right now. I'm sure many of them uh, would have seen impressive videos from Chris's lab uh, of the Shelly Audi TTS racing car beating a human driver and also a bit more recently the uh, the Marty car which is a modified uh, DeLorean which was doing donuts I believe uh, that video was also very viral Chris. Uh, Chris has been recognized with many many awards in recent years including the PKS award, the Ralph Dieter award from SAE and the Rudolf Kalman award from ASME and he also served as the first chief innovation officer for the US uh, Department of Transportation from February 2016 to January 2017. So we are very pleased to have Chris join us today and uh, we look forward to learning uh, what his team has learned uh, in terms of lessons from racing drivers um, and neural networks as well. So over to you, Chris. Good, thanks for that very nice introduction. And basically I won't be screen sharing so everything will come through on the video here. So if you spotlight my video, that should take care of yeah, I'm doing that now. Here we Perfect. Go. Yeah, awesome. Great. Well, thanks for the opportunity to present here. And what I want to do today is not necessarily a, an update on the latest and greatest, but I, I'm really excited that there is a community now thinking about uh, problems that have been interesting uh, to me for well over a decade, kind of like some of the earlier, earlier speakers in the first session. And so what I thought I would do today is just to talk about some of the lessons that we've learned, uh, in particular from professional drivers and from neural networks, and to try to answer some of the questions that were posed uh, for this workshop. So what I want to do today is to talk about sort of the demands uh, that racing places on modeling. We've talked a lot about the need for, for an accurate model. Well, how accurate? You know, what, what sort of orders of magnitude are we talking about? And then I want to actually do kind of a deep dive into a comparison that we did between Shelley, our automated race car, uh, and a professional driver. And this was sort of circa 2016, so it's not really representing the latest and greatest uh, of our racing algorithms, but basically humans haven't evolved too much since 2016. So I think the lessons we can take from human operation are still in fact correct there. And I wanna introduce you to a technique which may be useful to you of using phase portraits to sort of visualize what's going on with racing controllers. And then share a few results from some neural network projects that we did as well. And then finally, I kinda of wanna end on a philosophical point, uh, which I think is really important, but I haven't really heard too much which is really, do I wanna follow a path or do I wanna maximize acceleration? And what are the issues with trying to do both at the same time? All right, so without further ado, let's talk about racing. So this last weekend, in fact, actually yesterday was the running of the Indy 500. And if you look at the qualifying speeds for the Indy 500, these are in fact the top five qualifiers. And if you sort of look through the qualifying speeds here, you're like, there's a 0.15% difference between number one and number five, 0.15%. Has anybody here actually developed an engineering model that they would claim has 0.15% variation? It's kind of crazy. These speeds are actually the average of four laps. And if you look at Scott Dixon, his standard deviation was about 0.2%. Now, granted, the tires are changing. The temperature is changing. A lot of stuff is going on out there. Friction is definitely not remaining constant between 0.15%. And yet these people are able to achieve these really repeatable results. Let's say, you know, well, actually, so first of all, where was our race winner? He was just below the top five, Helio Castroneves. But you look at that and you're like, that's the difference, 231.164 versus 231.828. You have to get to the fourth decimal place in order to see the difference in these drivers. Astonishing. So let's say I could actually develop a model with only 1% error to try to predict something like this. Where would that place me in qualifying? Well, that would place me just, it would bump Max Chilton down. Uh, and the 30, there are 33 places in the Indy 500. You have to race your way in if you fall down below here. So we're almost off the grid, essentially with 1% error. And this is kind of mind blowing. If you sort of start to think about it, how do I model with this kind of accuracy? Clearly these guys aren't keeping this in their head. So, so what does this mean? So sort of tuck that away as we talk about like modeling demands uh, and the sorts of things that are going on here. Humans are really phenomenal. Uh, the best humans are really phenomenal. And I think there's some lessons to be learned here. All right, so what did we do? Well, we actually approached this problem with Shelly. Shelly was one of our first automated race cars. Shelly is a modified Audi TT. 
And when we started working, we developed a fairly straightforward approach to automated racing. So what we did with Shelly was to find a path using optimization. This is offline optimization. And on the car, we would compare to GPS and a digital map to see where we were along the path. We calculated a speed profile, which was based upon sort of a friction circle approximation where we did take into account load transfer laterally and longitudinally and how that would impact, very similar to sort of what Panos talked about earlier. Uh, and then we would accelerate and brake to match our desired speed profile and steer using a very simple algorithm. So we had a feed forward steering, which was based on a nonlinear tire model, our best guess at what steer angle we needed. And then a very simple linear look ahead controller so we could sort of trim the steering a little bit to stay on the path. And this is what Shelly looks like going around the path. So this is actually Thunder Hill Raceway Park. This is a sequence of turns where you can see that the car is actually taking a fairly nice racing line. And then you're like, that's a little weird. There's no one inside the car at all. It's sort of weird to people from the outside, but actually from the inside, it all looks pretty chill. Uh, you know, Shelly is making these calculations uh, and is able to drive around rather stably. So that's good. So how well did we do? Well, we did a couple of comparisons. The first comparison we did was with a champion amateur race car driver. So this is David Vodden. He's the CEO of Thunder Hill Raceway Park. So he knows the track like the back of his hand. He actually has a Spec Miata championship. So he's an amateur racer, uh, but at the champion level of amateur racers. And what we found was that actually we overall did fairly comparably to David. There were a few places where we were faster. There were a few places where he was faster, just sort of, which was interesting in its own respect. But we actually were able to take this controller and get fairly comparable results to a human driver. You know, basically, depending upon how you stopped and started, you could easily show that we slightly beat or he slightly uh, beat us. But we're talking within tenths of a second. So we got a little bit uh, cocky with this and figured we'd throw down the gauntlet to J.R. Hildebrandt, a professional driver who, by the way, started uh, the, his 11th consecutive Indy 500 yesterday. And it turns out what was interesting is that JR was a little bit faster everywhere. And again, the speed variation that we saw was something on the order of a, of a percent, maybe a little bit more uh, in some segments. But overall, around the track, he was about 1% faster. And there's a few things that you can take away from that. You can be like, well, you know, you're done, right? I mean, we're within 1% of a professional race car driver. That's pretty good. Um, but on the other hand, we were like, but you know, why? Why is it that he's a little bit better than we are? Uh, and JR gave us some real insight into this. And so I wanna show you some, some visualizations that I think actually point out why human race car drivers are as good as they are. So the first thing I wanna show you is basically 10 laps around the track. This is 10 laps of Shelly and 10 laps of JR. And I'm gonna show you turn two, which is a 180 degree turn. So let's just watch this once. You basically see the 10 uh, circles representing JR's trajectories and the 10 circles representing Shelly's trajectories. Yes, that's 10 circles on top of each other. So Shelly is doing something very repeatable. JR is actually kind of like weaving all around the road. There's, there's only a couple of similarities between his uh, different paths. One is that they're all faster than us. Um, the other thing is if we watch this again, at the very beginning, they look different. And then after that, it becomes fairly indistinguishable. So let's take a look at this at the very beginning again. You see, he stays out wider at the very beginning. And then after that, these paths are fairly indistinguishable from the one that we're driving, all right? So they sort of found something slightly different there. But in fact, he's not really finding a better path. He's doing something that we're not doing. So what is he doing that we're not doing? There's a great way to visualize this. Um, John Kegelman, one of my PhD students, applied this technique to visualizing race car data. It's using the concept of a phase portrait, which I think is way underused uh, in, in vehicle dynamics. We love sort of graphing things according to, to phase portraits. And so what this is basically is it's looking at the yaw rate, the dynamics of the vehicle, so how fast the vehicle is turning, and the side slip angle, so how sideways are you. Uh, and it's looking at equilibrium points, and at any point in that state space, how the vehicle might move. So you can see equilibrium conditions, you can sort of see stable regions and unstable regions. You can learn a lot about the car by plotting it this way. Now this plot is basically a constant speed and a constant steering. And you're like, hey man, when you're racing, your speed is not constant and your steering is not constant. But what we found is that even it really makes sense to plot these in sort of a quasi static case when you look at the current speed and the current steering in the vehicle. So what happens? Well, you see, I've got sort of three equilibria 
out there. One in the middle, this is just a straight ahead position, looks very stable because everything kind of converges back. The other two are unstable equilibrium, one of which is the one that we're going to be chasing and racing. And actually, the other one is the drift equilibrium that Panos mentioned in his talk. So you can find these things on the phase portrait. All right, so what happens when I actually uh, have this phase portrait and I change my steering? I know this is probably not going to show up too well resolution-wise, but you should basically see the picture. Uh, so right now, I'm traveling straight ahead. So if you look at the center, all of my trajectories want to uh, basically come back to the vehicle. Uh, and as I go further and further and further, these two equilibria converge. At this point, you see all my trajectories are leading out to disaster here. High yaw rate, high side slip. Basically, they're showing that my vehicle is going to spin out because at my, this equilibrium, I'm running out of friction on my rear tire. What I've done is I've driven up to the limit and I've encountered a situation known as limit oversteer. So I've run out of friction on the rear tire uh, and essentially what's happened is I've hit this unstable region. So you see the X is marking my unstable equilibrium. My uh, dot is marking where I am with my steer angle. If I continue to steer my car more and more into this corner, these two converge at which point I am unstable, All right? So what does that mean? Well, my rear tire force has hit its maximum value. And if I try to turn more than that, my vehicle is just going to want to reverse ends. The rear end wants to become the front end at this point. It's an unstable equilibrium on my face portrait and it is something that I actually have to counteract as a race car driver. Now, interestingly, this is something that you experience on that 180 degree turn I showed you because we're coming into the turn very quickly and we have to brake the vehicle. As we brake the vehicle, the weight transfers to the front and off of the rear axle. The combination of the weight moving forward and the rear axle being used for braking takes away a lot of the friction on the rear axle. So in fact, if I then am trying to corner at the limits, I will hit this oversteering case on the entry to this turn in Shelley. Okay, so what about uh, the opposite? Well, the opposite is when I hit an understeering case at the limits. In other words, I can run out of the tire force on the front axle. What's the behavior there? I can turn the steering wheel and it does nothing. Right, my system is stable, as you can see from the face portrait, all trajectories want to come back to this equilibrium, but it's uncontrollable. I can't do anything with the steering wheel and make the car do anything. I've run out of friction and I can turn the steering wheel you know, all I want. Nothing is going to make that car turn any tighter with the steering. So there's no controllability. The front tire force is the maximum. And this is in fact what Shelly experiences at mid corner. Shelly is a production car uh, with four wheel drive, but a front bias on that. And so if I'm coming around at a neutral throttle in the middle of my corner, I'm gonna actually have an understeering case. And so if I try to turn more, I'm not gonna be able to do that, but my vehicle is gonna be stable. All right, so if you understand these dynamics, then we can actually watch movies uh, of Shelly driving Shelly and JR driving Shelly through the corner and understand the difference between what our automated system and what the human driver are doing. All right, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you some movies this is of our automated system going into turn two. So you can see down in the lower corner, that's our 180 degree turn and that'll map our progress. Above that is our GG diagram showing our longitudinal and lateral acceleration. Above that is the steering angle and here is the phase portrait. So I'm gonna show this to you real time and then we're gonna slow it down. So this is Shelly on entry to turn two where we're braking uh, and then cornering. So as we brake, you can see my dynamics become unstable. You see Shelly is maintaining a little margin out there, and then it becomes stable again. Very quick change in these dynamics. So let's watch it at one quarter speed. All right, Shelly goes in there. You can see the instability that is caused by braking. I'm on my way out towards that, keeping a slight margin. I'm sort of exploring towards the edge of my friction circle there. And now I start to get towards the steady cornering part of my turn. So I'm on my gas. My system becomes nice and stable now, and the car just sort of pushes out to the pure cornering section of my GD diagram. Okay, that looked pretty good. I maintained a healthy margin for my instability and I got around the turn pretty quickly. Let's take a look at what JR did. And we're gonna visualize one of his data sets. All right, so this is JR going into turn two. Again, I'm gonna do this in real time. So JR goes in and oh my gosh, look at that. Oh, 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 he is chasing that unstable point until it becomes stable. Again, let's slow this down. You see, he is pushing it all the way to the limits. 
he's letting that rear axle hit its maximum. And in fact, you sort of see he has to steer back in order to catch it. He's exploring way outside our steady state GG diagram by actively letting the vehicle stay on brakes, exploiting this nonlinear region, knowing that he's got the room to basically drive out of that turn. This is why his path was different at the beginning of the turn, because he's staying on the brakes and letting the vehicle actually enter into this unstable region with the idea of leaving nothing on the table. He's basically removing the entire margin. Really fascinating, and it comes through, I think, very clearly uh, by watching the phase portraits. All right, so what did we learn from JR here? Well, he was a little bit faster everywhere on the order of 1%. Uh, he actually qualified 22nd, so we definitely would be off the grid if we're about 1% slower than, than JR. He uh, used all the available friction, and what's interesting is it wasn't like he was obsessing about following a path. His path was different, and you'll see this with the Indy cars as well. You'll look at these guys go around with nearly identical times taking different paths. Really fascinating. So it's not about finding the path. It's about pushing to the limits. But in fact, these limits are exactly where our modeling uncertainties come in because we don't know uh, exactly what the friction is. We don't know what all the details of load transfer and everything look like when we're right out at the very limit. So maybe learning can help with this. And we've seen some different approaches to learning in, uh, in this uh, symposium. I'm actually a hardcore vehicle dynamicist. So uh, in fact, we sort of approached learning with a little bit of a trepidation in terms of, yeah, right. Like a neural network is really gonna do as well as our models. I used to do multi-body dynamic models with Mercedes. It's like, I, I know the details here. And so we decided instead of learning from driver inputs and trying to do this in an end-to-end -end learning, let's see if we can learn a vehicle model uh, and let's leverage the data to build that. And our first, uh, our first attempts were actually kind of a disaster. And that sort of was nice to reinforce our biases. We're like, see, neural networks, they're not anything, anybody who understands like real physics. And then, then actually Nathan Spielberg, one of my uh, students, uh, hit upon a structure that worked phenomenally well. And so this is a neural network structure that we found to work really well. It's physically motivated from the bicycle model. So the inputs to this are the yaw rate, the lateral velocity, equivalently the side slip angle, the longitudinal velocity, and then our inputs, our steer angle, and because we did this for a front wheel drive vehicle, the front longitudinal force. So it's physically motivated by the bicycle model. And in fact, the output of this are the derivatives of the bicycle model, how fast my yaw rate is changing, how fast my lateral acceleration is changing. But what Nathan did was he actually included some history states. So in addition to the current yaw rate, lateral velocity, longitudinal velocity, steer angle, and front longitudinal force, he has 10 millisecond, 20 millisecond, and 30 millisecond lagged values. Now, if you think about it, if you don't include history, all you can learn is one mapping between uh, you know, these inputs and these state derivatives. But in fact, if you have this history, you potentially enable it to learn hidden states, which might potentially allow you to learn on model dynamics. That might potentially allow you to learn friction variation. So with this structure, we actually went out and did what I think was a very challenging test to this. Uh, we took Nikki, uh, Shelley's successor, uh, onto ice and snow in Sweden uh, and onto the racetrack in California. And we created a training set that contained uh, data from these different sets of conditions. And then we basically trained a single neural network model. And then to compare it to the results that we had with a feed forward feedback approach, and we actually just used it to generate the feed forward control. Um, I know there's been a lot of discussion of MPC and we've since implemented this in an MPC framework as well. So there's nothing here that's specific to using the simple control, but we thought it was a nice way of sort of isolating the neural network by itself. All right, so how did we do? What we did is we trained it on the, the mixture and then we basically just put that model and the car on a surface without telling it what surface it was on. And so the results were really pretty interesting. What we did was we took our neural network model, which is in green here, and our physics model, which was sort of hand-tuned. This is from a, a dry surface. So we hand-tuned it to the dry surface to get the very best fit of our physical bicycle model, which is a nonlinear model with the Fiala model for the tire. So we tuned it to give the very best fit. And then we compared it to our neural network model to see what would result in better tracking accuracy. And it turns out that actually the neural network model 
gave us better tracking accuracy. This is a histogram of sort of tracking error as we're going around. And you can see the neural network model is much closer to the, to the zero point uh, of our tracking error. We also compared the prediction error. And so we compared our neural network to a physics model that was best fit only on the low friction case, one that was best fit only on the high friction case, and one that was best fit using a combination of low and high friction. Now, obviously that case of you know, fitting a physical model to represent ice and, and dry pavement is kind of a lost cause, right? Because you're gonna end up with some average friction value, which isn't going to represent either. And sure enough, our neural network was about two orders of magnitude better uh, in terms of prediction error. But in fact, what was really interesting to us is that the neural network was actually capturing the low friction behavior and the high friction behavior better than our hand-tuned model. So we were actually able to pick up on you know, the little details. And we, we tested some things to see, you know, can we actually get relaxation length of the tires in a model like this, small delays in our actuators, uh, the fact that our tire curve model doesn't actually perfectly match the shape of our tires. And it turns out that this was actually quite effective. So if we start talking about moving towards greater levels of modeling accuracy, we were actually pretty impressed that this neural network model seemed to do well with that. As I've mentioned, we've since used it in an MPC uh, approach as well, and we got very similar performances, assuming, of course, that you're testing it on conditions where you've trained it. Uh, one case that we got into on the snow was we got into a very, very hard yaw rate situation, and the system had never seen that on snow. So of course, the neural network sort of interprets that as, oh, I must be on a high friction surface and therefore it didn't turn the wheel much to correct. So you have to make sure that these things are trained like any neural network. Um, but you know, conceivably you can say, well, if I'm developing a huge amount of data on the test track as I develop a vehicle, I could essentially have this for free at the time my development is, is done. All right, so will that be the end of the, of the, the day here that we can actually go uh, and just use a better model and get the level of accuracy that we need? I would say no, and I think there's one big lesson that I want to leave you with that comes from our human driver experiments, that there's more to it than just simply giving a good model with which to predict. And so if we look at what the human driver did, so basically this is a comparison of the parts of Thunder Hill that we ran, turn one, two, three, four, five, which you've seen in sort of a combination of the videos that we've shown here. And then you see this is actually the path dispersion as a function of the distance traveled along the track. David is B, JR is C, and Shelly is D. So as you can see, basically, Shelly has almost no dispersion in her path. She is path following, and by golly, she's on that path, right? So the only places where we get a little bit of dispersion are where we hit understeering regions, and she's trying to turn the steering wheel and nothing happens. So there's a little spread at two points there, but you can see that the path dispersion is like 20 centimeters. But in fact, if you look at it, both JR and David Vodden are allowing much more path dispersion between laps. Why? Well, think about this for a moment. Our idea is that when we use feedback, we don't have to have a perfect model. We'll actually use feedback to adjust. But that assumes that you have feedback that does something. That assumes that you have some headroom with which you can adjust your controls. But if you think about driving at the limits of a race car, you're either at the limit of the front tire, at which point your steering wheel doesn't do anything, or you're at the limits of the rear tire, where in fact, the rear wants to become the front and you have to counter steer. So there really isn't this, uh, this headroom available if I'm truly driving at the limits. And if I'm not truly driving at the limits, I'm not winning races. And so it's really an interesting thing if you start to think about it. Basically, following a path means that you aren't at the limit. If I'm trying to follow a path, I can follow a path and use the acceleration required to follow that path. Or in fact, I can choose to maximize my acceleration and take the path that results. And if you look at JR at the beginning of turn two, where he swung wide, the reason he swung wide was not necessarily because he said, I'm going to swing wide, but because he was maximizing what the vehicle could do. And that's simply the path that it took. And this is really something that, that holds true regardless of what control system you're using. It's not just a feed forward feedback sort of conclusion. If you think about it, this works for MPC as well. You know, if you are modeling the limits and you're wrong, your vehicle like Shelly is gonna be content to go to the limits and hang out. You really need something in your controller which is going to push you to use that acceleration if you wanna emulate the human driver 
and you wanna be as fast as they are. So hopefully these are some things just to kind of get people thinking uh, about some interesting parts of this problem. You know, since we obviously have a, a large crowd here thinking about this, I think there's a lot of great work to be done in this area. And I'm really excited that people wanna spend their time doing this. So just a few conclusions to take away from this. You know, the best human drivers are pushing their car to the absolute limits. And so we really start talking about tenths of percent differences. It's just mind blowing in terms of how repeatable they are and you know, how consistent they are with each other given all the variables involved. And I would say, you know, having done a lot of friction estimation work, if you wanna to try to estimate your friction level to 0.1%, go for it. But I think you're, you're doomed to a lifetime of failure uh, there given how many variables are involved and given the level of noise. So one approach might be to use this neural network approach where essentially we just bombard it with, with data. The history essentially tells us what the past looked like. And again, with enough uh, basically data of the combinations you want, we could potentially know uh, what the vehicle is gonna do in the immediate future. But you know, regardless of how uh, close we get with the model, I still think there's a fundamental issue. What the human race car drivers are doing is getting to the limits of the car. If you get to the absolute limits of the car, you have to be content taking the path that that determines. Uh, you can't really specify both. It's like trying to you know, specify voltage and current at the same time or force and velocity, right? If you sort of think about it, I can choose one of these things. I can basically get up to uh, the limits or I can follow the path. Now I, I can satisfy both according to my model, but I can't satisfy both according to reality. And I think there's a lot still that we can learn from humans in how they do this. Thanks. All right, let's give it up for Chris. Chris, that was just absolutely fantastic. And so much, so much information and experience that you've shared. Um, I'm sure our participants will find it very valuable. Um, you know, in racing, they say straights are for fast cars and corners are for fast drivers. And you just sort of <laughs> showed us that. <laughs> so Well put, very well put. Okay, so, um, well, that 